I gave my first talk on climate change in 1975. So it was climate change when we freeze or cry. And it was in the Clean Air Society in Scarborough. And um, there were two huge differences from now. One is that you talked about climate change and the a warming planet, because that's what I said we had to worry about, not the opposite of ice age. There'd be panorama programs with icebergs coming up the Thames, and that wasn't what we had to worry about, we already knew. And we didn't know quite how bad that was going to get. So people didn't understand the problem with it, I was talking about before. But the other part was that we didn't know how to tackle the problem. And both were different now. We know much more about the problem. Most audiences I speak to are aware that the climate is changing. They appreciate it themselves. They hear it going on around the world. Um, and the other thing is that we know how to tackle the climate problem. So it's very much like David Ashman was talking about. In fact, I, um, I've spent most of my career trying to understand how the atmosphere works. But um, that's a midlife crisis or late life crisis. I don't know. But in 2008, I went to start a new institute at Imperial College, um, which is very much more trying to bring together the. the uh, so I spent my career at the University of Reading. But then at Imperial, we're trying to bring together all the things associated with how we might solve this problem um, and also influence uh, politicians and business. And we got had a and there's a sister institute at the London School of Economics, and we had an advisory group, and I asked David Attenborough to be on our advisory group. So that was in 2008, he agreed. And he left us after a couple of years because he said he had to make this program about the two poles. So that was the freezing planet. Um, and I said to him, well, well we totally understand. Um, but before you go, we do talk to the PhD students. And he, he gracious man as he is, came and talked so beautifully to the PhD students, asked, answered questions, etc. He, he's that sort of person. That, that's how he comes across on that media, how it comes across um, just talking to a few people. So he's a, a great man there. The twin crisis we're, we're talking about here are the biodiversity crisis and the climate change crisis. And they are strongly linked, as he has said. And any talk I give, my expertise is more in the one than the other. But um, there's no doubt if we don't handle the, cri the climate change crisis properly, that is viewed today as the biggest threat to the biodiversity, actually, depending on how we handle the climate change crisis. And I think we we all know now that this is a crisis. In climate, then, you hear about carbon dioxide. And let me give you a few numbers there, and what closer to my expertise. For the last million years, the amount in the atmosphere, in whatever the units are, don't worry, has gone between 180 and 280. And then, 1750, the Industrial Revolution, starting after that, so we've taken in the last 200 years that 280 up to 420. And if you look at any geological thing, you see these slow changes and now this spike, this sudden spike where we've taken up to 420. And we know that that warms the planet. We know that's been known for 200 years, basically. Um, but the question of how much it warms the planet and we know the planet, um, that carbon dioxide we've added to the atmosphere will be there for the next, or the, the changed amount will be there for the next many hundreds of years. So if you drive your petrol car down the road, that has influenced the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the next thousand years. And we equally know that amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to warm the planet for the next thousand years. So, I mean, it's not something you can easily avoid. In my time, we've, we've had other crises. There's the ozone hole in the stratosphere. Both of these were associated with um, us using 
planet Earth as a dust devil. We, we thought it was infinite. We throw stuff into the ocean. Um, the great thing about the CFCs was that they were in, indestructible. So they wouldn't take part in any chemical re reactions. But actually what they did was accumulate in the higher atmosphere and then to this ozone hole. Now, we were lucky there. We, we observed it soon enough. And we also um, got to the bottom of what the problem was. And also industry had alternatives to CFCs. So ICI and DuPont were ready with the alternatives that they could uh, put up there. And the ozone hole is gradually healing now. So that was one that we could solve. The difficulty with the climate crisis is that the CO2, carbon dioxide, associated with burning, is actually had become fundamental in our lives. So it's not like the CFCs that we can easily get rid of. But we do know ways around that problem now. So the fact that it accumulates in the atmosphere, as I've said, is why you will hear everyone talking about we must get to net zero. The only way to stop climate change is for our net emissions to CO2 to go to zero. So there may be some pluses, but we've got to get some minuses to, as well to go with those. Um, now, it, you, you hear about a warming planet, um, uh, but it's actually far more than just a planet that warms uniformly. If the planet's four degrees warmer, then over land areas it will be five degrees warmer on average. And five degrees in the tropics. You imagine adding five degrees to the temperature in the tropics. Um, the human body cannot cool when a temperature taking account of the humidity as well is 35, basically. But there'd be large area of the tropics, which during the daytime people will not be able to work. So you imagine what's going to happen if the planet reaches that. Um, I mean, I'll emphasize this more than I think um, David Attenborough has. We've seen very small problems. It's made very small migration of human beings, and it's caused huge problems in Europe, etc. Now, you imagine, say, Bangladesh. The temperature's got five degrees hotter, the sea level has risen, um, and we know that's the next rule. Even if we stop warning the planet now, the sea level will go on rising for many hundreds of years. So the sea level goes on rising. Bangladesh, already the water supply is getting saline in certain areas. It's going to become at some point unlivable. Now is India going to say, okay, welcome, cross the borders here? Uh, no, I'm afraid that's not. So what I'll emphasize more than David Attenborough is that the human species Whenever stressed, and we see this many times in the past, stressed by weather and climate, then we get to revolutions, we get to countries actually fighting. So the cause is not usually the climate, weather and climate, but actually the weather and climate is there and exacerbates the problems already present. So I think the problem we face is when we exterminate ourselves from actually conflict. Um, that's what we will be facing. When we come back to the ideas of David Attenborough there, one way Jim Lovelock put them, this in the 1970s was the, the Earth as being Gaia, the living en entity of the planet. He viewed it almost as, a, as an interactive thing between the biology and the whole chemical system. Um, and there's two ideas which, if you try and talk to the fundamental Christian people in the US, there's two camps. One is we are stewards of this planet and we should leave it for the next generations. The other is this planet is to be given to us to exploit. And we've been far too much in the camp of the exploit and we've got to know that we are stewards because if we go on exploiting, we will exterminate ourselves. <coughs> As was said, um, the planet will go on living. The best solution for, for, the, for Gaia, planet Earth, is for us to disappear. And the question is whether we're part of the future of this planet. And that's the sort of message that Dave is giving there. We know how to do it. And this is the frustrating part. And I've been talking about this for nearly 50 years. We now know how to tackle this problem. 
internationally with the uh, accord in Paris, then the target of certainly no more than two degrees would tend to rise and preferably not much more than 1.5. We know how to do that, we can do that. 1.5 is nearly out of reach, not quite probably, but we could do that still. In the biodiversity area, there are the same sort of international negotiations. And there was a treaty, like the Paris Treaty in the biodiversity area, signed in December, I think, which was actually then, for the first time, saying by 2030, we will stop, we will reverse, we will stop this <coughs> attack on the biodiversity. And by 2050, we will have reversed it. So that trying to put a time scale on that. And actually, there was a treaty signed in March that um, David clearly was, this program was before that, but actually saying a, a UN treaty with all the world countries of the world agree that 30% of the world international waters will be turned into those really protected areas by 2030. So the agreements are starting to be there. And the question with all of this, is are we going to be too late? Because we would have changed to renewable energy. It's a much better way of doing it, but we would have taken rather longer. We've just got to come at doing all these things rather sooner than we would have done. Again, protecting the species, we've got to do it rather quicker than we would have done. We can't do it just by, oh, it will be done out there by technology, and everyone can continue to live the same life. I'm afraid it's not quite as easy as that, and that's probably why politicians shy away from this. They're sort of there, but then it's the long-term problem that gets squeezed out always by the short-term or the next electoral cycle. Yet, actually, people seem to be way ahead of the politicians. The finance industry has really got this, and they're taking this in a big way. Much of businesses, but the politicians, in the end, we need governments, both local and actually uh, national and then international, really grabbing this problem and actually taking the lead. They have to enable us. It has to be made easy for people to make the right choices. So I'm not sure I've rambled on there with a few words, but I hope I've slightly added to what David, that remarkable David, was able to say there. I certainly haven't had the film to go with it. But, um, if there's, and I, I fear you would like to know a bit about what the climate might be locally or whatever. I'm, gonna, I'm happy to answer questions like that as best we can. And there's a few things to go with. It gets warmer, but it doesn't get warmer by the same amount everywhere. So weather actually as a function depends on temperature contrast. So if the temperature contrast change, the weather will change. So we're not just speaking of a warmer planet. Some places will get much warmer. In a four degree world, the poles, the northern pole in winter, will probably be 12 degrees warmer. So that, you can imagine what that would do to the permafrost. Warmer air holds more water, can hold more water. A very strong effect. If the air is um, six degrees warmer, it can hold 50% more water. So it means in that warmer world, the extreme rainfall is going to be much more extreme. And that's what we're already seeing around the world. <coughs> more flash flood events, etc. The total rainfall in an area may not go up, but when it, it comes down in larger bursts, and that makes it more difficult to deal with that in terms of flooding, <coughs> actually keeping that water, etc. for our use. So you can think of a warmer world, not just equally warm, with changing weather, with more extreme rainfall, probably in many areas more variability as well. And we've seen that in recent years. So all these things are there. We're able to cope with them now. We could cope here, probably, if the temperature rose to two and a half degrees. But there's the various areas of the world that could not. We are no longer an island. We rely on food sourcing coming from elsewhere. We rely on there not being a huge migration. We allow, rely on people being able to live where they are and live a good life. So we do, as David was saying, 
the, the countries of the world, the poor countries, have to be allowed to develop, they have to be enabled to develop, but not take the same route as us. We've got all those big power stations, all that infrastructure left behind. The opportunity is there is to enable other, the developing world, develop in a new way, not leaving that same footprint. But that needs our help again, it needs our money, and it needs our help. So we have to stop thinking of ourselves just here and now, can we continue to live the same life, continue to fly around the world, whatever. We've just got to think about everything we do. Now, um, I did, I know in the end it comes down to what, well, what can I do? I picked up a couple of things from Imperial College from the Grantham Institute there. This is nine things you can do about climate change, you can do. And this is nine things you can do to protect the natural world. So I've got a couple of copies of these and they're online at the, the Grantham Institute at Imperial College. This is actually the most sought after thing on downloading from the web at Imperial College, this document here. Nine things you can do about climate change. Number one on both this and this is use your voice. So you use your voice with your friends, with your family, with your village, with your region, with your national politician. Because in the end, that's our voice. That's the first thing we can do, is tell people we take this problem seriously. But there's other things. What's happened to your money? Where's your money kept? You know, where's your pension or all your funds? Are they kept in a responsible way? the diet, many of the things that David has said. So I will leave these here, but do look at them. But I think I should stop now and actually allow a bit of question and answer or a discussion. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you very much for that. Touched on the short-termism of politicians around the globe. Would removing money in politics be a big factor in changing attitudes. And I say, I say that as an impoverished politician myself. Okay. It's yeah. not funded by yeah. big oil. Well, that's right, yes. Um, there's no doubt. Um, the people, the where the money lies is often where we've been able to make to in the recent past, and that's a lot with, say, fossil fuel in particular. And I think if we could remove that influence on politics and make the individual voices count more than that heritage of money that's got, then that clearly would be beneficial. Um, and I have hoped over the years that the fossil fuel companies would actually take the lead, because they had many of the skills to take the lead in going to the new ways of doing things. And BP started to do that back oh, I don't know, John, under John Brown and some years ago. They had the BP change to better than petrol. But then the stock market price you know, was not looking good and it, it all fell away. And the stock market price of an oil company is essentially dependent on reserves in the ground. Yet we know we cannot use the reserves that we already have discovered let alone a new oil field in the North Sea. That new oil field in the North Sea would not be used by us. It's international. It leads the same price everywhere. It goes everywhere. Just because it's in our waters, it will make some people richer, but not the whole country. Um, so we already know enough of that, and those vested interests, yes, we've got to damn that somehow. Yes? I think that... <coughs> journalists are rather crucial. Uh, for example, the Telegraph is consistently taken um, uh, uh, pro-oil, pro-continuum as we are, um, and make, making any effort um, to improve things idiotic. The, the, Yes, it's very sad, isn't it? Yes, I mean, Christopher Booker used to write for it. And, um, and I have had my times with some of these people, uh, Lord Lawson. I've had on the Today programme a discussion, quotes, where the BBC got someone, a climate scientist, and then they got someone very experienced with the media that 
seat is on the other side, and you put the two of you together. And um, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, at one time, I, with a group of Royal Society fellows, um, the, the uh, president of the Royal Society arranged that we would go and speak to these Lord Lawsons and some people from the Telegraph, etc., uh, in the House of Lords. And we went along. Uh, we didn't get a drink of water, let alone a cup of coffee in the three hours. Um, and we talked about the science. And at the end of that, he said, Well, we basically agree with you, although you're probably a bit overrated. Yeah. However, how um, you will make the people of this country poorer, and how dare you shackle the developing world with with having to do it this way rather than the cheapest way, which for them was coal and oil, etc. So there are two arguments, they, and they're totally specious. They were specious there. But they accepted the science, but they were not going to follow through to the implications of that. And that's been true with the Christopher Bookers of this world, etc. So it's become a very much uh, a political thing for its own sake, where the, the any uh, any evidence <coughs> is ignored. And people have said to me in the past, do you believe in climate change? I said, I don't believe in climate change. The evidence is just incredibly strong. This is evidential. And the trouble is that it gets into politics. It is then starts to be arguing not on the basis of evidence, but on the basis of theology, political theology. And that's when it becomes Come really dangerous. One really good thing in this country was the Climate Change Act in 2008, which went through Parliament with 453 voting for it and five against. I think. So it really was across the board. And that was world leading legislation which committed the UK, it did a number of things, but it committed the UK at that time to an 80% reduction in our emissions by 2050. And it put this, this then, the government was legally bound to this, and also it set up a target, five year targets. Um, and I was on the Climate Change Committee who had helped advise on those targets. So the UK presently has targets to 2035. Now, do you see that in your newspaper? Because at the moment, the policies will mean that we do not meet those targets. Yet the government is legally bound to actually put into place the policy to meet those targets. So this is actually something we should really be crying out about. And the Climate Change Committee does, but then depending on the politics of the newspaper is what, how much you'll hear about. Mm -hmm. So sorry, just to be clear, the government is breaking its own law. Well, mm -hmm. it's been taken to court, on this one. It was taken to court yes. Yes. last yes. year, right. by the Yes. And so this, the, the plans that have been come out uh, again, they're likely to be taken to court again because the response to that, the plans produced on the basis of that, still miss the target. So that it, it will be a recurrent thing. But it, so judicial review is the sort of thing that can, can happen, or some well, uh, well versed group can then take them to court, and that is happening. So they, they are, the Climate Change Committee produces its annual report, which is um, essentially how, how are we doing. And say in some areas, energy, we're doing pretty well. However, if you take most areas, then we're not. Uh, we have electric vehicles, we have much more efficient engines, yet if you take the emissions from tr tr road transport, just that level. So hardly gone down at all. Um, then if you take um, our housing stock, then the old housing, we know that's going to be quite difficult to insulate, but we can do something about it. New housing, the fact that our new housing would be laughed off the scale in, in the rest of Europe is a, just a travesty. You know, we should not be putting up these things which we hope will last 50 years when we know they won't last for 50 years looking like they are. And, and it, it now means, and John Gummer, a little deep in this year, who's chair of the Climate Change Committee, really attacks these builders by, they should, they're actually selling people 
houses which are going to cost them so much more in the future because of the energy use. When you're building a house, it costs very little extra to actually make that house almost zero carbon. When you try and retrofit, it costs a lot of money to do. Yes? I mean, you're saying that uh, the, the people want to, to do something more about this. Yes. Yeah. Politicians, that's the problem in terms of the leadership. But we don't have a major opposition party, even, that is responding to that, if that is true. You know, where do you see, where do you see the political will coming Yes, from? and I agree. It can be quite discouraging. And we see that all these um, authorities will declare a climate emergency. And then they think, oh, now we can go and we declare an emergency. <laughs> and then it's business as usual after that. If we have an emergency, it's like if you have a war. If you have an emergency, you have to do something about it. And it's not declaring an emergency, it's what you do afterwards that matters. It's like having a pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And the money could be found to, to handle a pandemic. Um, and the money can easily be found. I and mean, actually, the Climate Change Committee has usually come up with a number. That it's one or two percent of our GDP would actually bring us right to solve this problem. And you know, that is just something, and in the end, and it, in the past, dealing with climate change was seen as a cost. So the, the economists have this model where we would, we would get ever, ever richer at 4% per annum or whatever. And if you did anything about climate change, it would actually move you down. Now, the picture is really so different. If we don't handle climate change, the economy is going to do this. If we do, there are actually new opportunities with new industries. So the question for us in the UK, we had a head start with the Climate Change Act and we've almost lost that. Are we going to be in the leaders in these new technologies or not? And now windmills are essentially made in Denmark because we didn't get on with that. Um, but it could be that like aero engines, Rolls-Royce don't make their money from selling the aero engine, they make it from the service servicing those engines. And it could be the same with windmills, particularly as they're way out at sea. We have all the experience from the North Sea. And we could develop the huge industry which will be needed around the world for actually servicing these huge windmills. Solar, again, uh, was ignored by our government and has really been a, a, almost a people thing, the way that's grown. You know, the, the demand for solar power now has been bottom up. The fact that in England we still have something that stops a windmill being put on land is ridiculous. <laughs> what was done wrong was that the community should benefit in some way from having a windmill in their location. Now that may be a community owned or it may be their electricity is cheaper. But there should be a benefit. Um, now I happen to think that a windmill is rather more pretty than a, a pylon and certainly more pretty than a power station, which if you live in southern England, it's up there somewhere usually. You know, so Drax power station, well we had Dick, but we got rid of that now. So, mm -hmm. so uh, there's still those up north. A windmill is pretty nice stuff compared with those. Um, so we're doing the wrong things. We could take the lead on this. We're grudging all the time from the top. I mean, at Imperial College, we, um, between my institute and the business school, we started this Masters in Climate and Finance. And now, for those 100 places on that, there are a 1,000 well-qualified people trying to get in every year. And the industry, the finance industry, is gobbling these people up at the end, too. So the sort of green investment is really taking off. I think there's been a bit of a hiccup with this price of oil and suddenly that. But Everyone knows that's the long-term investment. So the finance industry get it. The young kids knowing what course to do, even though they want to be in finance, they're hearing that way. So what we see, and if you look at it, you see all these amazing ideas. As usual, we're incredibly good in the UK at innovation. But you take it to a level of exploiting it. We don't actually support it, and someone else takes it off. You know, so both. This is how we have to handle the crisis. If 
we are going to be anything like in the world with an opportunity for our kids in the future. We should be taking a lead in it. This is the, this is the growth story as well, in terms of not necessarily GDP, but certainly in terms of quality of life and for a short term GDP as well. Sorry, I have to start preaching on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, I've got three questions, apologies, two from me and somebody who couldn't make it here. Should we give up on politicians and focus on the judiciary and the accountants? Apparently, those are the two people's bodies of people who've got some hope. Well, we have to have the lead from the top. Now, we have to persuade them. Some of that is through the courts. Some of it is through the ballot box. And for God's sake, write to your politician frequently, saying, you didn't support this bill. Why not? Or you should support this bill. And in the US, they're always doing that to their congressmen, but here somehow we've elected these people and it's not nice to interfere with them now. Um, and in our area, we've had Alok Sharma as our MP. Now, years ago, when we tried to talk to him about climate change, he didn't really want to know. But there's an example of someone who seems to have gone on the road to Damascus because he actually did a very good job in Edinburgh and he's now stood against his government and said you're not doing enough on this. So there is someone there, unfortunately he'll probably disappear next time now. But um, we have to let these politicians know that this is important. Um, I, there isn't enough noise coming from the Labour Party as well as the Conservatives. Mm. There needs to be more, I think, um, but there has been in the past. Um, and they, um, I won't get into the various uh, liberal Democrats have their bit, and of course the Green Party is, is the threat. Somehow the government always seems to be the, see being the threat from the extreme right. We've got to let them see the threat is from not handling these crises, whether you call it right or left, we've got to handle this crisis. <clears throat> and it does need community. If that's left wing, I'm sorry. But I shouldn't have brought community who's left thing. I win. I think it's actually means we all live on this planet together and we've got to handle this. So I, I'm like Margaret Thatcher, I do believe in society. And the only way, way to handle this is through society. Can I say as a green politician, I'd rather not be fighting the fight that I'm fighting, but we have to do it. You have to think about who you vote for. I'm saying vote for who. Yeah, absolutely. And so when there comes an election of any sort, we will be asking the, all of you, ask the candidates, what are your policies on this? And whatever your party says, will you vote for these sorts of things? Yes, um, again, I just believe that um, London will take it. Um, um, I forget what exactly calls of, but um, they were aiming to um, people sign up. Um, the next election, and they would do all the analysis of what all the, the different party policies yeah. were, and they would actually mass all the evidence and be presenting it. Right? So yes. This is the kind of vote. This is the kind of vote. Right. Are you going to get the kind of vote? Yes. So they really, and it looks like the possibility of being a really effective pressure organization. They're not quite maybe get some other party there and just say, let's put mass evidence about what people want in a, a, a kind of vote. Yeah. So I think that's right. There's so. There will be people pressing at the high level what is your party and then your own candidate. What is your what is your view of this? I'm sorry, the other other two questions. Oh, just quickly, no, we, we about ten years ago we were there's a lot of news about the Gulf Stream and how actually in England our temperatures might drop, okay. but we don't hear that anymore. Yeah. Okay, well it's let me give a few slight academic nuances on that. So the Gulf Stream is not allowed to switch off. The Gulf Stream itself is actually wind-driven, and the same occurs in the Pacific Ocean. But the difference about the Atlantic Ocean is that the warm waters go right across the equator up to the north, up to the northern regions of Iceland, Greenland, the waters there, and they become dense enough to sink. And so they sink like this, and there's this overturning circuit. And that's why the North Atlantic is so warm. If you compare us with the equivalent of Alaska, then you agree we're pretty warm. So this overturning circulation like that is what keeps us warm, essentially keeping the northern parts warm. And to make it from water to sink 
it has to be both cool enough and also saline enough. So it has to have enough salt. So if it rains too much on this, it won't sink. Or if you get melting ice. And that's the concern here, is if there is considerable melting ice, that could make that water too fresh to actually sink down to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so that Atlantic overturning circulation. Um, it's the best evidence, the best ideas we have at the moment is that that Atlantic overturning circulation is likely to weaken. And it's already played some role in that the minimal warm, warming on the planet is really the, ocean, the Atlantic Ocean south of Iceland. And that's really because of this slightly weakening overturning circulation. If it did cut, cut off, it would be a huge change in the climate of the Earth. Ironically, Northwest Europe could be cooler, um, while the rest of the planet warmed, or maybe not warmed much. But it wouldn't be any nice thing for us if it happened. It would be a very, very different world. So there are various things that people refer to as tipping points. Um, as a mathematician, I prefer to call them thresholds of some nonlinear behavior. But there is a question of whether the Atlantic overturning circulation might stop. There's, as mentioned on the program, as we warm the tundra, it's possible that methane might come out of the tundra and, uh, and out of the coastal ocean. Um, there's something like the Amazon rainforest, where if you're attacking it enough by deforestation and also the climate is changing, is there a point at which it really is no longer sustainable and essentially, you know, in some years it becomes savannah, basically. That wouldn't just affect that region, actually, it would affect everywhere downstream of that, essentially. I mean, it's not just a local area. Um, there's the, these ice sheets on, the, the, on Greenland and Antarctica. Um, and at some point, there will be an irreversible uh, position, the temperature, where the melting of Greenland will become irreversible. It may take a few thousand years, but actually it will it essentially becomes irreversible unless you can get the temperature back again. And um, there's about seven meters of ice locked up in Greenland. Um, the um, big change in ice could come from the West Antarctic ice sheet. The West Antarctic ice sheet is actually sorry, I'll give you a slide for mm -hmm. is actually very different from what you might expect. A lot of the ice is actually grounded only on a few islands under the ocean. So it's actually, the bottom of it is below the sea level. And you can get the warm waters coming underneath. And the question is the stability of that. And there's evidence that it's actually surged in the past. And in the previous interglacial, um, then there's evidence when, um, that the sea level were many meters higher than a considerable contribution. One of the things about the last intergovernmental panel on climate change, it's a very conservative sort of group because everyone in the past has had to agree if you're going to put something in the document. But actually they've been they're going to be taking a slightly different tack. If we don't, what, how, what can we not rule out in sea level rise? And the situation at the moment is by at the end of the century, we can't rule out two meters of sea level rise. And the next Thames barrier is being built with that in mind, where the plans will be that at each stage um, you could make a decision which allows that possibility. But of course, you might depend on London, but you can imagine what would happen to many of the cities in the world and much of the coastline of the UK with two meters. And if we go to 2300, we can't rule that 13 meters sea level rise. Yeah, so we are talking about numbers which. As I say, these sorts of pressures, I don't think people would idly sit there and just say, oh, I'm finding life a bit difficult. The pressures of actually, I want that food, I'm going to have that food. You're not coming here. I know there's millions of you. No, those pressures would need to, yeah. well, I, we don't want to go there. Um, so this is for somebody who couldn't make it, who's really passionate about our local waterways and our yeah. chalk streams. What do you think the likely longer term effects on our chalk aquifers and streams will be? Will they become more like the African savanna luggers? Oh, well, that's uh, probably not the African savanna. What, what we may be looking is something where 
well, it's called a ball, and that seasonal variability could become greater, I think. So we're, if you're looking at um, heavier rainfall events, that puts a stress on these little rivers about whether they can take it. Um, if we come to an area like this, and um, is the, the winter rainfall is low, probably going to increase that sense of and summer rainfall, they don't decide it. The earlier models suggested summer rainfall less. But actually then some of the ones with a final resolution have said there could be more thunderstorms in the summer. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear about the net rainfall. But I think the thing about it's coming down harder when it comes mm -hmm. might be the biggest influence on, the, on these little streams. I, I believe that uh, the, the change in the weather that we've been having in the last few years have had a, an impact on the um, productivity of British agriculture. Yes. Um, that's going to get worse. What, what, how much of average yields gone down? I don't know the number. Mm -hmm. But I do know we have to take agriculture incredibly seriously here. One is can we produce the same crops for ourselves, um, when we are getting the, the higher temperatures, the rainfall that may be coming in these shorter bursts, with perhaps these longer drought periods, um, and maybe higher variability. And the other side of it, of course, agriculture is a significant <coughs> producer of greenhouse gases. And there are no plans in government at all on that at the moment. Um, the Climate Change Committee have been screaming at me for years on that um, because there are things that can be done, but it's not simple. And actually, when I talked at the end when I said about net zero, agriculture is probably the, the place where you think there's still going to be some emissions and we may need to draw down some CO2 in other ways to compensate. But there's no doubt agriculture, both in terms of feeding the world and feeding us, is, is going to be a serious thing as these uh, as the climate change. We've seen actually in Spain, the drought in Spain has led to real problems in the supply of what we expect to come from Spain. Now, of course, the temperatures are reached 40 degrees in southern Spain. So uh, again, our reliable sourcing of things from elsewhere may not be so reliable. So we've got to see what we can produce for ourselves and the sort of intensive thing, agriculture, maybe even in, um, in buildings where you get this hydrophonic stuff, you know, and can be growing crops like that. The serious thing about diet, uh, which I never say is give up meat, is actually could you reduce somewhat, um, and then because it is so inefficient to feed these things, grow them, feed them to these animals, then we eat the animals <coughs> rather than it directly. And the, the bad thing around the world is, of course, the, the developing world, or not so developing, China, India, sees our diet as a good way to go. You know, so the middle class thing in China is to start drinking milk. Mm. Now, they used to not, not have breast cancer, they used not to have prostate cancer, <coughs> both of which are, can be encouraged by dairy products. But they're starting to know these things now, they're starting to take on, and of course the meat eating is increasing. So, then actually we're talking about population. There's, you've got population times how those people live. And the population will stabilise um, already. India has just overtaken China. The, the almost dramatic thing about the Chinese population is how fast it's going it's going to go down, and they maybe will have a problem of not enough young people to do things. So if you handle the problem too drastically, then you get a problem the other way. But um, world population, then there's India. India will probably go on a curve to a higher level than China, but will turn over. I think the unknown at the moment is Africa, because there's a huge expansion to three million anticipated by population people, but the agriculture in Africa, there's no way it can feed that number. So what is the solution to that problem? Well, massive education as soon as possible, helping with doing things new ways, and in the end it's the solution for us as well as to help around the world other people solve their problems.
not colonial, but helping them as they wish. So that was a perfect place to about food. So <laughs> 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 